The starting point of this book, Project Europe, is actually quite simple. And it is to argue that we all have a problem with the European Union, regardless of whether we like or actually we hate it. And the problem is simple. It's that we do not easily find a middle ground. The question is, how do we talk about the European Union today? And I would think that there is basically two versions. Either the European Union, less in the United Kingdom, obviously, is seen as the magic bullet solving all our imminent problems, and hence we should finally bring it to full fruition. Alternatively, the European Union is seen as the worst thing possible, a bureaucratic, undemocratic juggernaut destabilizing countries economically and culturally. Similarly, we might wonder about the European Union's future, for which I think there is also two radically different versions. Is it on the verge of collapse or weathering the storm rather well? And Helen, if you could be so kind to show the second slide, please. I think that street artist Banksy's 2017 mural can be read in either way, either again as an image of the European Union in lethal crisis on the verge of being torn down, or, and this is what the second image shows on that slide, as the story of a lonely man on a wobbly ladder who might destroy the star while leaving little mark on the wall. And this is the reason why I think that Banksy's work is such a pointed comment um, on our times. Now, what my book tries to achieve is to contribute to a more balanced picture of the European Union by analyzing its history. So far, historical research has mainly been interested in the politics of European integration, negotiations, motives, interests, and things of that kind. Whereas I think that we know stunningly little about the effects of European integration. And this is what my book tries to assess by looking into several dimensions, particularly for the period of the Cold War. Questions that I'm trying to answer include ones such as, did European integration really contribute to peace? And how about its contribution to raising prosperity? Was it really a community of values, as it is so often argued? And how about the democratic deficit? Each of the book's eight chapters tackles one of these big questions and tries to arrive at rather succinct answers as to the effects of European integration for the lives of Europeans and others during this formative period of European integration. Now, this is a short presentation, and again, we're struggling with technical problems. So I just want to give you one example, and that is the peace question. So the question of whether the predecessors of the today's European Union really contribute to creating or guaranteeing peace. And again, I would argue that there is two narratives about this question. If you, for instance, visit the website of the European Commission's representation in Germany, it offers you a very succinct answer. And I quote or translate from German, for 70 years, the European Union has been guaranteeing peace. Not very surprisingly, you do not find the same lines if you happen to visit the Commission's delegation. It used to be a representation, now it's only a delegation in the United Kingdom. And others, obviously, are even more critical. Brexiteers such as Boris Johnson have argued that the European Union did not contribute to creating peace at all. That it was only NATO that played such a role next to the national and nation states. Now, my argument actually is that it did matter, but later and in a very different form than we have thought so far. And I would like to run you through that argument in several steps. Firstly, if we could please see the next slide. Um, there were, if we look at the level of motives, obviously the ideas to create peace, particularly peace and reconciliation between France and Germany. So at the level of motives, um, peace certainly played an important role, but, and this is an important, but there were also important national interests, for instance, in the French coal industry to make sure that Germany would not become too powerful at that moment in 1950, when Robert Schuman, the French foreign minister, made the famous declaration that then became the starting point of what today is the European Union. But again, as I mentioned before, I'm less interested in motives than in effects. And there I would argue that if you look at these early stages of European integration, they were actually not particularly big. Why? Several arguments. Firstly, because this whole process, starting with the Schumann Declaration, was beginning too late to really impact the post-war Cold War order in Europe. That had already basically happened in the five years prior to this early steps of European integration, and hence you could argue that Europe was simply too late to really matter. And secondly, maybe more importantly, 
um, what then unfolded with this coal and steel community in later steps only actually deepened the worst security issue that was existing at the time, and that is the Cold War confrontation. Um, the Soviet foreign ministry in 1957, when the treaties of Rome as the next step beyond the Schuman Declaration and the Coal and Steel Community was um, um, signed, actually declared that the treaties are, and I quote, further deepening um, the division of Europe and heightening the tensions within Europe. And if you could please go to the next slide, this caricature from Czechoslovakia at the time is also making that point that this Europe, this institutional Western Europe project is tearing Europe apart and not pulling it together. Now, one could of course argue that things might look different if you look at Western Europe. And there I would argue that it also didn't really help to unite Western Europe in this um, epic struggle with Eastern Europe and the uh, Soviet camp, because what you see at the time, and this is the next slide already, please, that this did not, this project did not bring all of Western Europe together, that Western Europe was in fact split into two camps, that there was the European communities, the EC, as seen on that slide, and EFTA formed in 1960, the outer seven, as they were called, um, as member states at the time, in comparison to the inner six of the EC, which also certainly did not strengthen Europe in creating peace at the time. And moreover, and this is the next step for which I don't have a slide here, is to argue that the effects, I don't have a slide at this stage, uh, that the effects were not too fantastic because the issues that these early communities were dealing with were rather technical, mundane, and not directly linked to security concerns. There were ideas of their kind, particularly in 1954, with the idea to form a European um, defense community, but that failed, and hence the issues such as coal, steel, and also then a common market and agriculture, I'll come back to that later, um, were not actually particularly helpful. So in that sense, you could argue that it was not so helping to in creating peace. This also has to do with this coal and steel community because one could think that it helped to prevent war between France and Germany by pooling, again, coal and steel, but only after a few years it was dysfunctional and hence also didn't really live up to that role. So this is the negative side, if you will. But I would also want to argue that there were some positive effects already in these Earth's first decades of European integration. And this is the but, and if you could be, please go to the next slide. I think that the effects were less at the level of hard security and something that was very tangible, but rather at the more informal and soft level, such as creating a culture of compromise between um, politicians and camps and countries that had only waged war a few years earlier. And again, this picture of the first commission of the European Economic Community of 1957 might serve as an example. What you see here is a friendly man in the first row, bold, looking into the camera, Siko Mansold, who is a Dutch socialist who was a resistance fighter during the Second World War. What you have on the far right is a man with glasses, wearing glasses, Walter Hallstein, German, a former Wehrmacht officer who is now the commission president. And to just pick a third example, in the back you have a man by the name of Lambert Schaus, who was from Luxembourg, who had been a slave laborer during German occupation. Now the point is that little would have brought these three men together in 1940 or 1944 in a peaceful fashion, but only a few years after the war, they were all trying to create a different, a better, um, a united future by working side by side. And that actually was quite remarkable. And the second point I'd like to make, and this takes us to the next slide already, that while not creating hard security and peace in that sense, there were other sites and dimensions that I would like to call um, social peace that um, were actually quite important for the European community. And it brings us to an issue that is quite controversial. So if you could see the next slide, piece, uh, please. Um, and that is the common agriculture policy. Again, for very good reasons, a hate object, particularly in the United Kingdom. But I would want to argue that actually there was a positive side in certain ways. Why so? Because what the common agriculture policy was, was less 
a policy of production and feeding Europeans, but rather a hidden form of social policy against the backdrop of massive transformation crises that had hit the hack sector in continental Europe since the 1870s, which had led to a lot of political unrest in the interwar years and also the rise of radicalism. And now, if you will, the common agricultural policy with its massive funds also helped to reduce the political tensions by easing the transformation into societies where agriculture would not be a massive sector anymore. I, of course, want to add that there was a massive price for this hidden social policy that economically, politically, environmentally, this policy was quite catastrophic. But I think, again, if we look at this from the angle of peace and see this as social peace, it was actually um, quite interesting. Now, fast forwarding into the second half of the Cold War, I would argue that there is another dimension um, that actually made um, the European communities contribute to questions of peace. And this is very much, and takes us to the next slide, by stabilizing young democracies in Southern Europe. Um, this is again more the dimension of social peace than peace in the sense of military and security issues. But if you consider that Greece uh, that became a member state in 1981 and Portugal and Spain that joined the European community in 1986 were young democracies at the time coming out of periods of authoritarian rule and dictatorship, membership was for them actually something that they perceived and that also actually in fact helped to stabilize their internal order. Again, monies, funds, subsidies, uh, the regional policy and um, the agricultural policy were important instruments in that sense. And this story continues and takes us to the next slide already, um, to um, the period at the very end of the Cold War, where I argue that this process continues. Um, people often don't remember that in 1919, the, the European community already crossed the Iron Curtain, because on the very same day that um, the former GDR joined the Federal Republic of Germany, it also became part of the European community. And also there, the new measures of the European community, particularly the subsidies, helped to make that transformation somewhat easier, at least in the short and medium run. And the same could be said also, and this is Gdansk in 1980 here on the slide, that when it came to the transformation in Central and Eastern Europe more generally, Europe, and this again, this Europe of the European community served as a platform to reduce the tensions of turning um, the project uh, of turning this the unstable Europe into um, something that became more stable, that where again political transitions were eased and where again the community claimed to play an important role. Again, I would argue particularly in a form of social peace, not um, hardcore peace. And again, we should also remember that here it was very much the countries, the peoples themselves in East and Central Europe, not the European community that was at the starting point of um, making that transformation possible. So in that sense, the European communities could also self-fashion themselves as a force of peace. And that role was basically given to it. It was not so much that it was actually pushing for it and was very good in helping that in the first case, but it was more and more than in the 1990s associated with that role. And again, going back to the question of heart peace, if we go back um, to the 1990s, I would argue that there the European community was rather dysfunctional again. The best example being, or the most problematic, I should say, um, Yugoslavia falling apart in the 1990s, where some, such as the Luxembourgish foreign minister Pols, argued that finally Europe's hour had come, that Europe also in the security crisis would be able to sort our problems um, um, basically itself. But that obviously was not possible. It took massive American intervention to sort out uh, the crisis on the Balkans. In that sense, also there, I would argue, there is this distinction between this hard dimension of peace where the European community continued to be not successful at all. And on the other hand, the social dimension of peace where at least for some time, it did make a difference. This already brings me to my conclusion, because the idea was to only to speak for some 20 minutes. I would want to argue that European integration did make a difference. But the argument is that it was only later and in different forms that it mattered than we've thought so far. 
And this, I hope, becomes particularly evident if we refocus from the questions of motives really to the questions of effects of European integration. This was a very quick short summary of um, a chapter that has some 40, 50 pages. Um, and I do not want to argue that also the policy instruments that were deployed at the time necessarily have to continue for the future. So I do, for instance, think that the common agricultural policy, the CAP, um, did play an interesting and important role to help and ease the transformation crisis during the post-war decades. But that does not mean and should not mean that um, it should be funded to the same extent also for the future. I think it raises a more interesting intellectual question. And the question is the following. If the European Union makes any sense, what actually does it do to help those who now are witnessing crisis, not only due to corona, but also as those who lose out in processes as digitalization and globalization. So I do not see it to the same extent contributing to social peace as it did then. Again, the um, decisions taken at the summit last month um, point a little bit into that direction, but we still have to see how they will go. Um, but I think, again, it shows also that history has lessons for us here. Now, if we talk about the second point, and that is security, I would want to underline again that the European Union has much less credentials in being a force that can make a difference when it comes to hard forms of peace and security in comparison to these more social welfare kind of issues. And that hence also grand expectations of the EU becoming a major player in the foreseeable future, I find comparably unrealistic against the backdrop of history. So the overall goal, and with this I'd like to end, is to use history to bust some of the myths that we have in the discussion about the European Union. Again, I think that its peace contribution worked in the early years, but only to some extent, but that the argument that we have so often, that again, um, it has always been, particularly in the early post-war constellation, a force for creating peace is somewhat problematic, whereas the counter argument that it was all about nature only also remains um, doubtful. Um, again, the last slide shows you two pictures of this Banksy mural, and I would uh, want to say that the future is obviously very open, that the question remains how dark the clouds actually are that we see there. And with that, I'd like to end and um, like to open the discussion and look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Kieran, for that. Um, uh, if anyone has any had any questions or anything they'd like uh, Kieran to cover, um, uh, please uh, do drop us a note in the chat box. Um, Kieran, I don't. I, there was a message about uh, wanting to hear a little bit more about Brexit. I don't know if you want to maybe give uh, a bit more detail on on uh, your thoughts on that. Maybe as a historian, let me start with a little bit of history there first. And the history that quite a few people are not particularly aware of is that this is not the first time a country is leaving this project Europe, if you will. Again, obviously, it is the first time that a full-fledged member state um, decides to leave the European Union. But there are these two other cases that actually are, I think, quite interesting. This takes us into the early 1960s to Algeria, which had become part of the European communities as part of the French colonial empire, but not as a colony, but rather in French legal terms of the time as part of France proper. And it is interesting that with the independence after this bloody war of independence in 1962, um, Algeria did not just decouple from um, France, but also from the European communities. An interesting process that few people have studied so far, for which I also um, have quite interesting insights in the book, because I think um, it shows us something about the processes that um, also Brexit can trigger. I will come to these effects in a second. I first want to mention the second um, time when a country decided to leave. This is taking us into the 1980s, takes us more precisely to Greenland, which had been a part of Denmark, again, part, if you will, of its colonial history. And um, in 1982 had a referendum, which led in 1985 to have it change its status from being a full part of the European community 
to only be associated with the European communities. Now, what this process shows, I think, is two. If I take the two examples together, for one, um, it shows that actually leaving the European communities was already quite difficult at the time, though the European communities then was a very different creature than it is now. What do I mean with this? Um, if I have mentioned, again, Algeria as first example, let me go back to that. On the very date, basically, that Algeria was leaving the community, the president of the country, Ben Bella, wrote a letter to the aforementioned president of the European Economic Community, Walter Heilstein, asking if one could not leave things as they were. Um, so basically, on the one hand, there was talk about independence. On the other, for mainly economic reason, Algerians had a big interest in continuing to have their close trade relations with the European community. Um, this particularly had to do with one sector, with wine, which was a major commodity in Algeria at the time. And to really put this in a nutshell and summarize this quickly, um, the European communities first accepted Algeria to remain part for some 10 years in an informal, legally very obscure way. But when in the 1970s, early 70s, um, new policies on wine production kicked in in the European community, Algeria certainly and suddenly was shut off. And that also contributed massively to the demise of Algerian wine production. So in that sense, I think there is a very interesting story of trying to remain in informally and then leaving in a very harsh and problematic way thereafter. Um, Greenland, um, even shorter summary, is an interesting story because in the beginning, the idea was to remain quite far away from um, the European communities, mainly also for fishery reasons, by the way, whereas remaining closely linked to Denmark, whereas today the discussion is quite opposite. So history does not have one single answer for you, us there, what could happen with, um, with Brexit. But I think what we've seen over the past years, the past four years, that leaving the European community is much more difficult than we had thought and many Brexiteers had thought is certainly also happening there. And secondly, that certainly the question of new links and how they should look will be a question for the next generations. I personally also think regardless of what will happen in the remainder of this year, and we all know that the um, discussions are ongoing and not going particularly well, this will probably not be the end of the conversation. I would imagine that whatever the result might be, and that might be a hard Brexit, um, the discussion will continue and might change the direction of interaction also in the foreseeable future in the next five to ten years over again. Great. Um, I think I've sent a couple of questions to you, Kieran. Yeah. Um, can you see those? Or if not, I, I'd be able to read them out to you. I, um, how much does Brexit affect European Union unity since Britain is one of the most stable European countries? So I've started to answer that, but I'm happy to elaborate on that further. I think, again, the interesting, the paradoxic effect actually is that Brexit has um, led to more unity amongst the remaining member states so far. Um, also, I was quite skeptical at what um, Brexit, when again the referendum happened and then the negotiations started after Article 50 had been triggered by the United Kingdom, what they would lead to. But what we've seen is that the remaining member states of the European Union were able to an amazing extent to stand together and come up with one unanimous view. And this is also what we've seen over the past months um, um, since the official Brexit date. I think, again, it is interesting to first note that the interesting, more interesting question is, of course, to ask why. And I would argue that for one, uh, many member states have seen that, um, of course, if they're not hard vis-a-vis -vis the United Kingdom, then also other countries might find it too easy to leave. And hence, um, this is certainly a, um, a reason that has brought the member states together. And secondly, I would also like to say that probably they have also against them um, crisis in the international system considered whether they would be big enough and strong enough to play alone. Again, the United Kingdom is a big member state, a big European country with um, a lot of muscle militarily, economically and so on. But if you consider Luxembourg, Malta, Cyprus, whatever, um, of course, where also discussions have been going on about uh, leaving at least at some point, um, that would be quite different. And hence, I think also there, um, Brexit has been a sobering moment that has brought the European community more together and union together, at least for now. This obviously can still change, but this is what we've seen so far.
Um, if if that is an answer to Sarah's question, if if that is helpful, otherwise, Sarah, if you could please let me know if that is technically possible, I would maybe continue um, go answering the second question. Would that be all right? Uh, yes, that's that's great, and I'll keep an eye out in case Sarah comes back to us. Great. So that's a question by Michael. Um, is the European Union sustainable in its current form, both economically and socially? An excellent question, and if only I had the answer. Again, what I'm trying to show in my book is also where we stand today against the backdrop of history. And honestly, I think um, that the European Union is not quite sustainable in the way in its current form, um, but it is changing every day and while we speak, if you will. I think few people would have imagined only half a year ago that the sums and the new political formats that were then triggered as a reaction to corona would have been possible, including the question of debts by the European Union itself. So in that sense, it's a moving target, if you will, and um, it has stumbled from crisis to crisis. But what we have seen is that all the crises of the past 10, 15 years, of which there have been many, remember again, the Eurozone crisis, the Brexit discussions, again, Brexit um, and many other issues, have not really led to a demise of the European Union. So I would argue that one of the main reasons why this hasn't happened is that there is still too much in the European Union for many member states either in the regional policy, maybe in security issues, in the common market for sure, and the single market that makes it still attractive. So in that sense, I would think that it would always remain imperfect, but it has also shown an amazing amount of resilience, both economically and to a lesser extent socially. And the main question that I would have is whether these funds that have now been, been planned to be spent um, um, against the corona crisis will have a real effect. And that, I think, uh, Michael, will help to answer the second part of your question on whether particularly the social dimension um, will be tackled in a productive way. Um, honestly, of course, I think it also has to do with how the corona crisis continues to unfold. If there should be strong second waves, and not only the national levels, but certainly also the EU level would probably be overburdened. Um, again, the sums that have been put on um, the table are massive and they would certainly help a good way, but they need to be spent, of course, in an in a, in a, um, effective way. And of course, it also depends on the corona crisis not getting worse. So in that sense, I think the crisis that we're living through at the moment has put a lot of pressure on any political system, but also on the European Union. And um, at this stage, it is quite unclear how this will um, unfold in the future. If this is an answer to, to Michael's question, I would propose that I take Charles' question next, if, if uh, you all agree, and I will first read it out to you again. Do you think that the rise of populism in Europe has been affected by a lack of social integration and thus a weak European identity? And the answer, if you will, um, to your question, which is also a great one, is very clearly yes. Of course, we need to remember that populism is not um, um, a phenomenon uh, that affects the European Union only. You see it very clearly and strongly in a long list of member states of the European Union and addressing there very much um, the national level. You see it obviously also as a global phenomenon, taking us from Brazil to the United States onto India and many other places. So in that sense, um, the European Union would only be one of many objects um, of this rise of populism. But I think that the European Union is also particularly vulnerable because of its clear problems, um, two issues that um, populism can address. And this is exactly what I was trying to say before by arguing that a certain level of co social cohesion, that this highly controversial common agricultural policy that I mentioned before was able to create um, is not really upheld by European programs at the moment. Again, corona uh, measurements and reconstruction funds might change this, but if you look particularly into the past 10 years and the effects of the Eurozone crisis and the world crisis since 2008, the European Union has done very little and German governments have also been playing a very clear role in this in helping to bring social integration further. So in that sense, um, I think that the rise of populism 
is playing an important role there. I think that the measurements taken um, are decided to be taken. And again, there's still some important steps um, to be taken before they will fully unfold last month, also are very much taken against the backdrop of this rise of populism. And it remains an open question whether they will be sufficient to tackle it in a good way. What we have seen in many countries, Italy being an interesting example, that populism was less successful than one might have thought over the past months. But also there, I think the crisis isn't over yet. And um, it very much will depend on how the economic and also the um, health situation in a country like um, Italy will unfold in the next months to see whether, again, populism will remain um, slightly less visible or whether there will be a news upsurge and um, Matteo Salvini might become the next um, head of government again. Um, are there any other questions at this stage? Lauren, I, in what I have on my screen, I don't see anything. I'm also wondering if Sarah, Michael or Cheryl have, um, are, are happy with these answers or if there is anything else I can um, address. Um, I'm not seeing any, any other questions here. Um, actually, we've got somebody who's just said thank you so much um the talk was very helpful um and cheryl has also uh thanked you for uh, your answer um so yeah let's um just give it a second in case anyone else does want to submit a question um again I, oh, we've I, got we have got a new one i will just yeah. send that across to you kieran thank you Um, so that's a question by Michael. What is the situation with many Balkan states and Turkey in joining the European Union? Another very good question, Michael, that you're raising here. Um, let me maybe start with Turkey. And I think this is one of the other problematic stories with the European integration process, because um, you might know that since the 1960s, discussions of um, associating or even having Turkey join the European Union or communities at the time have been going on. And the European Union also in discussions of the 1990s when they finally became more serious has often been arguing, well, if you meet certain conditions, then um, we will let you in. And this was the starting point of negotiations. Again, formally, they're still to some extent ongoing, but I think that most people would agree that they will probably not lead anywhere. And the turn away under Erdogan into a very different political direction than the one associated with the European Union will also underline um, this argument. Now, one could argue that it was therefore always right not to make too clear promises to Turkey and not let Turkey enter the European Union. Um, I would belong to those who also argue, well, again, the European Union also is partly responsible for Turkey's pivoting away from um, those values that the European Union tries to stand for, at least. So in that sense, I think this is one of the problems of making promises one is not willing to live up to and also creating a long term process which was full of frustrations. With the Balkan states, I think that on the one hand, it will be very difficult to stop certain processes of negotiations of countries entering like Serbia. And on the other hand, this will also make things in the European even more difficult. Again, there is already a long list of countries where um, the question of human rights, of rule of law, of democracy um, do not look good. And it's not only Poland and Hungary, it's also um, Slovakia amongst others. And um, anyone who follows a little bit of Serbian politics will know that this is also not um, the kind of democracy you would want to in leaving economic problems aside. So in that sense, I fear that this will also create further problems for the process of the European Union and might also make decision making even more difficult and again make it more difficult for the European to stand up to those values that I personally as a citizen would want it to be associated with, even if in my book I also show that um, also that is a very complex story and that the European Union has been much more ambivalent in representing or also fighting for certain values and norms than is often claimed. Um, so that would be my answer to that question, hoping again that it is of some help. Great, thank you, Kieran. Um, any further questions from anybody? 
don't see any so Maybe I could just um, add one other remark um, to what we've discussed so far. So the book um, tries to be readable and it tries to summarize history in a way that is accessible um, also for people who maybe are less interested in history in its own right. But it is also a book that tries to really ask the question what we can learn from those 50, 60 years of European integration for the situation today. Um, again, I would want to argue that there is no one single lesson that we can learn from history. History is not um, um, kind of a master plan for tackling the future, but that there are issues from which creatively we can extract lessons. Like for instance, again, where the European Union has been doing comparably well, what it can do, where it has certain resources and experience in doing things, and where this is much less the case. So in that sense, I would hope um, that this book would also be a starting point for discussions of this kind. And to be honest with you, I also see it more as as a platform to hopefully further discussion about the European Union. I'm not trying to say here that this is the last word of research in this field, but I would hope that it all makes us think further of what the ups and downs, the positive and the more problematic sides of the European Union actually are beyond the rather happy history narratives that often come from Brussels on the one hand, and the often very critical and single-sided remarks that we have from populists of all sorts on the other side. Great, thank, thank you very much, Kieran. Um, so we haven't, haven't had any further questions. So um, I think, I think um, we could uh, probably bring things to a close then. And um, I will just um, like to finish by saying uh, thank you very much. And um, apologies again for the uh, technical issues we've experienced, but um, hopefully you are still able to enjoy things. Um, actually, we have had a one further question. Okay. I don't know if you wanted to quickly try and answer that. Kieran, I will just send that across to you. Sure. It's another one by Michael. Is it fine <laughs> for more wealthy nations like Germany to remain in the European Union? Again, another <laughs> a great question and not an easy one either. Um, I think what we have seen over the past months, also because of the corona crisis, is member states thinking about that to a larger extent than they have done before. There was a reflex with Brexit to simply say, well, we need to remain together and we need to make the Brits also see that there is a price of leaving. But I think that the corona crisis also has led many member states to really think whether it's financially worth um, for also healthy nations to remain in the European Union. And again, there is two answers. There is the Dutch answer uh, and the answer that also you find in the other countries that have been labeled as the frugal four, whereby they would argue, well, it's not really worth it, um, at least not if it's about spending an awful lot of money now for these recovery funds, uh, which would not help our citizens directly. And there is the answer by countries like France and Germany who argue, no, again, where we stand does not suffice. We need to go much further. We need to really unleash um, these, these big budgets and um, invest big money, basically, to, to save um, not only only the union, but also its member states from crisis. What we have seen as a result, I would argue, is that the second and the latter of these camps has clearly won the day, because as I was trying to say before already, the measures that were now decided um, actually would have been absolutely unthinkable only half a year ago. Obviously, they're slightly less than um, those who had hoped for more had wanted, but I still think that um, the decision that was taken by the political elites was clear, a clear yes to the question that you were raising. And I think particularly for Chancellor Merkel, it was also a question not just of solidarity with Southern European countries hit by the crisis, but also very much hinging on the perception of how important the market, the single market actually is. With um, an economy, and that also, for instance, was true for the Dutch economy, that is very much integrated into production chains that really cross all of Europe and where it is clear that an idea to go back as a, as a country that very much um, um, is based on exports and production of commodities, to go back to a national system will not work, um, that you either can also um, accept a major economic crisis at home or you need to make sure that this common market remains intact, not only in the sense 
of keeping the productions, the producers abroad afloat, but also to put some pocket uh, money into the pocket of people in countries like Spain, Italy or France to make them survive and weather the crisis in a better form than they would be without them, the monies coming from Brussels. So in that sense, I think, um, again, it's an up for discussion whether the financial means that have been invested will suffice. And that also depends on, as I said before, on how the crisis will continue to unfold. But this is the answer that political leaders, I think, in the majority of member states would be giving you right now. Uh, you should see a couple of other questions, perhaps if we uh, have those as the last questions, um, Kieran. So question by Sarah, I think. What is the position of Germany in the European Union? Is it becoming more dominant in its role in the EU? Um, again, another great question. I think the answer is simply yes, if you compare it to the period of the Cold War, where Germany was basically in the beginning a rather weak country, obviously, and then became very muscular in an economic sense, but never really used that economic muscle um, and um, gave France the position of being really, you know, the porte-parole, the leading country in many ways. This has changed since the 1990s, but I would argue that the discussion about Germany as the real hegemon of European integration so far is somewhat misleading because particularly under Chancellor um, uh, Merkel, the German political elite has accepted that it can only be um, also successful for German interests if it works in close cooperation with others. Again, this was the backdrop of um, Merkel finally accepting the many offers of um, uh, Emmanuel Macron to do something together, leading to these reconstruction funds. And I think also what we've also seen in these last summit negotiations is that there is clear resistance, particularly from smaller member states like Austria, like the Netherlands, like Scandinavian countries of not accepting, again, what in the old days used to be called the Franco-German engine of European integration. And that also gives a clear counterbalance to Germans' potential influence. Um, so in that sense, I don't see this happening to the extent that some people would argue, and I think that there is also structural reasons why this will not really work, um, including some of um, the political, um, you know, the, the legal and political order of European integration, where, again, there is many mechanisms that present, uh, prevent the biggest member state from simply calling the shots. So I, I don't see this happening, um, at least not so far. And there is another question by Cheryl, if I see this correctly. If there is time for one more question, I'm happy to answer that question. You mentioned before that the European project was probably unsustainable long term as it currently is. Do you think that there is a way to strengthen integration for the long term? Um, another excellent question. Honestly, I don't think there is the silver bullet, the one answer that one can give to make this happen. What I see as the biggest problem is really to involve citizens more into this project, to give more democratic credentials to the European Union. Again, as you all certainly know, this was also a major dimension in the Brexit um, discussions. And again, the European Union is not doing particularly well there. It's also clear that, of course, the, the massive decisions um, for the reconstruction funds that uh, we mentioned before were taken without long and extended discussions in national parliaments and um, at the national levels. So in that sense, also what might have been necessary with regard to the crisis it does not, is not an, um, 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 a fantastic example of democratic legitimacy, at least not so far. And again, I think that will be very important to also explain to European citizens more why actually you want to have the European Union. And I would think then the answers that um, the union has given so far are not fully um, satisfactory to people. And again, what I'm trying to do with the book is to give some answers. Again, not easy answers in the sense of the European Union is fantastic, but rather giving us hopefully an informed basis to see what has actually worked quite well and what are the reasons why certain things don't make much sense and why they ought to change. So um, in that sense, um, probably the easiest answer I can give you is read the book and hopefully that would, would give you further insights into the question.